Hi everyone, during this chapter we are going to go over the very first system for our ANP 241 course, which is the integumentary system. So during part one of this lecture I'm going to talk about the structure of the skin and its accessory structure, which is hair. During lab we're going to go over the structure of the nail. During part two of this lecture I will talk about the skin glands, wound healing, and skin disorders. So first, let's talk about the terminology of the skin and a little bit of background information before we go into the structure of the skin. Another name for skin is the integument. So when we talk about integumentary system as a whole, we're talking about not just the skin, but skin with its accessory structures, which are hair, nails, the skin glands, including the sweat glands, oil glands, earwax glands, the blood vessels which supply oxygenated blood and take away deoxygenated blood, as well as the muscles and nerves that are present in skin. Another name for skin is cutaneous membrane. So anytime you hear the term cutaneous, it refers to the skin. So subcutaneous, anytime you hear the term subcutaneous, it talks about below or beneath the skin. So a subcutaneous injection is an injection that is given below the surface of the skin. The branch of medicine that deals with the skin is called dermatology and if you were to have any uh, condition of the skin you would go visit with a dermatologist. Now being the most superficial organ system of the human body Skin is also the most scrutinized organ system of the human body. It is socially the most judged organ system because it's also present on, uh, uh, it, it is the most superficial. It is also prone to the environmental, um, the, the, the environment. Uh, so dirt, dust, so it, it, the hygiene issues affect skin the most compared to the other systems of the human body. And it's also tied to self-worth and self-esteem for the same reasons. It is the largest organ of the human body, uh, contributing to about 16 to 20 percent of the total body weight in an adult human being. And it can vary in thickness. So on the thinnest parts, uh, which is around the eyes, the eyelids, it can be about half a, half a millimeter thick to about four to five millimeters thick on its thickest parts, which is um, on the palmar and the plantar surfaces. And it can be about 22 to 24 square feet in its total area. Now, talking about the anatomy of the skin, it's made up of three basic layers, and we're going to go into detail about each and every one of the three layers of the skin. So starting from the most superficial layer. The most superficial layer is called the epidermis. Epi refers to above or over on the top. So the epidermis is the most superficial layer of the skin and it is made up of keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. So it is an epithelial tissue. It is composed of flattened cells, it has several layers of cells, and it is rich in the protein keratin. So these three terms, keratinized, stratified, and squamous, are key to describing the true nature of this epithelial tissue that is mm, composed of the epidermis. So when you're describing the epidermis, it is really important to describe it in its entirety. So think about this. The epidermis is the most superficial layer. Why would it need to be keratinized? Why would the most outer layer of the skin need to have this tough exterior layer, which is rich in the protein keratin? We'll talk about the answer shortly. The middle layer of the skin, which is also the thickest layer of the skin, is not an epithelial layer, but it is a connective tissue layer called the dermis. Now the dermis is subdivided into two layers, and it is made up of areolar and dense 
irregular connective tissues. We're going to go into this a little bit more into detail in the next few slides. And the third or the deepest layer of the skin is called the hypodermis. Hypo refers to below or beneath or the subcutaneous layer and is almost entirely made up of adipose tissue or fat. So I'm going to spend a lot of time on this image explaining the different structures and the different layers of skin. So first talk about the different structures within the epidermis. So the epidermis ranges from here to here. So you can see the basement membrane right here. And the basement membrane is not flat, but is kind of convoluted. And you see it forms these downward facing fingers, right? You have these downward facing fingers that form out of the epidermis. Face downward, downward pointing fingers. Now these downward pointing fingers are called epidermal ridges. So you can see there is several different layers of cells and as the cells move upward, so the younger cells are located towards the bottom, the older cells get pushed up to the top and as they're get, getting pushed up to the top, they get flattened even more and you have these downward pointing fingers called the epidermal ridges. So on the top layer, you see that the top layer is not smooth but it is kind of bumpy and it is perforated by holes. You have these holes through which sweat comes out and they are called sweat pores and you have holes through which the hair is poking out as well. So that is the structure of the epidermis. Then comes the thickest layer of the skin which is called the dermis. So the dermis goes from here to here and it has two sub layers. The more superficial of the two layers of the dermis is called the papillary layer. So the papillary layer is made up of areolar connective tissue. So it's loosely packed. It is made up of collagen fibers, elastic fibers, and reticular fibers. And it has these upward pointing fingers. Take a look at this. This is an upward pointing finger. Here's an upward pointing finger. Here's one, here's one. And those upward pointing fingers fit in and form a zipper-like junction with those downward pointing fingers of the epidermis. So those upward pointing fingers are called dermal papilla. So the upward pointing fingers and the downward pointing fingers form kind of a junction like what it would when you stack up two Lego blocks together. Now that is the papillary layer of the dermis. Now the deeper layer of the dermis is called the reticular layer and it is made up of dense irregular connective tissue. So it is richer in collagen fibers and there's a lot going on in the reticular layer. So the dermis is actually very richly vascularized, meaning that it is richly supplied with blood vessels. So you see the red and the blue fibers. So the red fibers supply the oxygenated blood. The blue fibers take away the deoxygenated blood. You see a lot of nerves and nerve endings that are located here, which are the yellow fibers. You see these convoluted structures, which are sweat glands. We'll talk more about the sweat glands in part two of this lecture. So here's a sweat gland. It's going to produce the sweat and the sweat is going to be secreted out on top of the surface of the skin through a sweat pore right here. Now also housed in the reticular layer of the dermis is the hair follicle and the hair bulb right here. And right next to the hair follicle is housed the oil gland. Another name for the oil gland is a sebaceous gland. Now, anytime you have a hair follicle, you have a muscle next to it. This muscle allows you to get goosebumps or allows your hair to stand upright when you're scared, nervous, or feeling cold.
So this muscle is called the erector pili or the piloerector muscle. We'll talk a lot more about this a little bit later during the chapter. Now the third layer of the skin is called the hypodermis or the subcutaneous layer. And as you can see, it is mostly adipose or fat tissues. So to recap, we went over the epidermis and the keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. We went over the epidermal ridges, the sweat pores. We went over the papillary layer of the dermis with the dermal papillae. We went over the reticular layer of the dermis with the uh, sweat glands, the oil glands, the, the um, blood vessels, the nerve endings the hair follicles, and we went over the subcutaneous layer of the skin as well. Now, now that we know the structure of the skin, let's quickly go over the functions of the skin. Now, being a very tough, uh, uh, containing a very tough protein called keratin and linked by tight junctions, it is your first line defense to trauma and infection. Skin is acidic. It can range between 4 to 6 in pH, and it is your first line defense against microbial infection and trauma. Now, because it secretes oil, it is also waterproof and protects your internal organs from UV radiation. It is an endocrine organ. Now, endocrine means that a substance is going to be secreted directly in your bloodstream. So skin helps production of vitamin D. So in vitamin D synthesis, the first step in the process is your skin getting exposed to sunlight. It serves as a sensory organ. So the sensory receptors for heat, cold, touch, pain, generalized sensations are, are located in the skin. It is an organ of thermoregulation. Thermoregulation means that it helps you maintain your internal body temperature. It helps you sense heat or cold by, by vasodilation or vasoconstriction. In, in the first few chapters of this course, we went over what vasodilation and vasoconstriction is. And your skin, being richly vascularized, helps you do that. The sweat glands in skin help you cool off when your body temperature is high as well. In conjunction with the muscular system, your skin helps you communicate without being verbal. So how would you communicate being happy or sad without the use of words? So you would smile or, or frown or pout. It is a reservoir or, or a good storage supply of blood because of being richly vascularized as well. Now let's take the epidermis and look at it a little bit more closely. I'm going to explain this using the um, images more because I think images help you understand a lot better than text would. So I'm going to go over the structure of the epidermis. We're going to talk about what cells are located in the epidermis exclusively and what the functions of these particular cells are. So let's start with the deepest layer and move on to the most superficial layer. So this right here is the areolar connective tissue of the papillary region of the dermis. This blue line is the basement membrane right here. Now this layer is the deepest layer of the epidermis and it is called the stratum basal. The stratum basal, stratum means layer, basal means base. So stratum basal is the deepest layer of the epidermis and it is a mitotically dividing layer. So this layer is dividing rapidly by mitosis. Now the next layer is also the widest layer. So it goes from here to about here. And that layer is called the stratum spinosum. Now as the stratum basal is dividing, 
the older cells get pushed outward into the stratum spinosum. Now, as the old cells get older, you can start to see that they start to become granulated in appearance. They become granulated in appearance because they are producing a protein called keratin. Now, let's take a look at a couple of cells right here. In the stratum basale, you have a specialized cell called a melanocyte. A melanocyte is a cell that produces a pigment called melanin. Melanin is a pigment that, that gives skin its normal pigmentation. Another cell that is hanging out in the epidermis is a keratinocyte. A keratinocyte is a cell that produces keratin. Now the touch receptor that is present in the epidermis is called a Merkel cell. So right here is a Merkel cell. Now anytime you have a sensory receptor, you have to have that signal sent to the brain. And here, next to the Merkel cell, you see a sensory neuron. So, so far we've seen three cells between the stratum basale and the stratum spinosum. We've seen a melanocyte, we've seen a keratinocyte, and we've seen a Merkel cell. The fourth cell, or the third cell, we're going to see here is a Langerhan cell. So a Langerhan cell is a macrophage. So it's going to eat up any junk, any wounded cells, any old cells, um, any pathogens or foreign bodies that have gotten here. So it's a macrophage. So that is the Langerhans cell. Now I have the stratum basale, which is dividing by mitosis. The older cells get pushed out. So stratum spinosum is where the cells are still alive. They're starting to get granulated. As the older cells get pushed out, they become more flattened and more granulated. So that flattened and more granulated layer is called stratum granulosum. Now, as the cells get more granulated due to the, the accumulation of keratin, they start to die off. Now, in thicker skin, you have a layer that has a translucent appearance. Now, this is a layer of semi-alive cells. You have some cells that are alive, some cells that are dead. It's a mixture of cells. And it has that characteristic translucent appearance. That is called the stratum lucidum. Now, on top of that, you have a layer of completely dead cells called the stratum corneum. This is completely dead keratinocytes. Now, when you exfoliate the skin, now, the top layer of your skin is dead, and when you exfoliate it, it's the dead keratinocytes that fall off. Now, dead keratinocytes, falling of dead keratinocytes after exfoliation is completely normal, and that is what about 80% of household dust is. Now, there are a lot of people that are allergic to household dust. Now, household allergy is not actual allergy to your own skin, but it is allergies to something else. Now, we exfoliate skin and it falls off, that there's something else that is feeding off of these dead skin cells. It is the house dust mite. This dust mite is microscopic. It's invisible to the, the naked eye, and they are feeding off of these dead keratinocytes. And it is the feces of this dust mite that people are allergic to. So they're feeding off of the dander or the exfoliated skin cells. So this image clearly shows you right here the epidermal ridges and the dermal papillae as well. So the next layer that we're going to talk about is the dermis. We've mostly talked about the dermis with its papillary layer, with its reticular layer, the fact that it has sweat glands, it has the hair follicles, the hair bulbs, the fact that it has the oil glands as well. We've talked about the papillary layer, how it is more superficial. It's more made up of the areolar connective tissue. Now, a new concept right here. The touch receptor of 
the papillary layer. This guy right here. You know that the, the sensory or the touch receptor of the epidermis was the Merkel cell. The touch receptor of the dermis is the Meissner corpuscle right here. Meissner corpuscle. Now the pressure receptor of the dermis is the Pekinian corpuscle. Pekinian corpuscle right here. So please remember these two. Pekinian corpuscle is a pressure receptor located deep in the dermis and the Meissner corpuscle is a touch receptor located shallow or, or superficial in the dermis. Now the reticular layer of the dermis is made up of dense irregular connective tissue and has more collagen and less elastin. And hence, when this layer stretches, it heals or contracts less easily. And hence, this layer is where stretch marks tend to form or striae tend to form. The hypodermis is mostly made up of adipose connective tissue or fat, and it has two major functions. One, it serves as a long-term energy storage or as an energy reservoir, and it serves as a thermal insulator to your internal organs. Now, because it's richly vascularized, it is a good site for injections. So, a lot of injections, pain medications, any kind of therapeutic injections, they are injected directly into the hypodermis. Based on the thickness, of skin. You have thick skin and you have thin skin. And thick skin and thin skin are different based on the, not only their thickness, but their presence or absence of hair. Thin skin is present all over the body except for certain parts, which is the palmar and the plantar surfaces, the lips, certain parts of the genitalia. So here's the here's two really good light micrographs. To the left is a light micrograph of thick skin. And you can very, very clearly see this is a longitudinal section. You can clearly see all the regions of the dermis and the hypodermis. So here's the reticular region with the dense irregular connective tissue. Here's the papillary region with areolar connective tissue. Here's where you can see the stratum basale stratum spinosum, stratum granulosum, stratum lucidum, and stratum corneum. Here's where you see thin skin and you see an emptied hair follicle as well. Now talking about the normal pigmentation of skin. The normal pigmentation of skin comes from a pigment called melanin. There are different types of melanin. You have a type of melanin called eumelanin, which has brown or black undertones, and you have a pigment called pheomelanin, which has yellow undertones. So unless a person has a genetic skin condition called albinism, in which a person lacks melanocytes, every person has a certain amount of melanin. Now, melanin, the production of melanin increases or decreases with exposure to sunlight. Lack of sunlight could trigger breakdown of melanin. Increase of sunlight can cause more production of melanin. Now, there's a, a substance called hemoglobin in blood, which can give certain parts of skin a pink or reddish appearance. We've talked about the normal skin pigmentation. Now we're going to talk about the abnormal skin coloring, which has clinical significance. So first, let's talk about blue skin coloring, which is called cyanosis. Cyanosis can mean that a part of your body is not getting enough oxygen. A lot of times when infants are coughing due to pneumonia or whooping cough, they cough and their face starts to turn blue in color. So that means that that, that is called cyanosis of the face. So that means that they're, that they're lacking oxygen. 
sometimes when the tourniquet is tied tied very tightly, the fingers or, or the arm can start to appear blue in color. That is called cyanosis. The opposite of that is when the blood vessels are dilated too much and a certain part can be uh, can appear very red. That is called erythema. Erythema is redness. This can be because of an injury or it can be because of an exercise because, because of vigorous exercise it can be because you're very angry um so it may or may not be normal so redness is called erythema now another abnormal skin coloration is yellowing of the skin this can be seen in the sclera of the eyes it can be seen on the skin in some severe cases or the nails now this is because of a substance called bilirubin. Now, bilirubin is produced by the liver. Now, sometimes when the liver is not functioning properly uh, and your blood is not breaking it down, it is you have excess bilirubin in, in, in blood, and that can cause abnormal yellow coloration on different parts of your body. Paleness. Paleness is called pallor, and it's usually a sign of low uh, blood iron levels or anemia. Albinism is the complete lack of melanin. It is a recessive genetic condition, and it, it is uh, that is called albinism. Uh, vitiligo is an autoimmune condition where a person's body starts attacking their own melanocytes. Michael Jackson actually had this condition where where uh, at some point in the person's life that there are patches on skin that start to appear lighter in color because your body is attacking the melanocytes in that region. Now a hematoma is actually a bump. It's actually a bump where there's been a a, a, a trauma of some kind or a impact of some kind and blood kind of pools in that region and clots and then it takes on that characteristic blue or purple appearance um, and forms the bruise. Talking about regular skin markings. The first skin marking we're going to go over is a callus. A callus is when your stratum corneum becomes very thick because it has been subjected to a lot of friction. An example is the fingertips of guitar players. So when a guitar player plays, there's a lot of friction between their fingertips and the guitar strings. And as a result of that, the, the, of that friction, the stratum corneum on their fingertips is very thick. So that is what forms that callus. Calluses can form when you're, you're wearing a shoe that rubs against the, the soles or parts of your feet as well. These are easily removable um, with a callus remover as well. Friction ridges or fingerprints. Now, your skin normally secretes oil, and your fingerprints, each person has a unique fingerprint or unique set of friction ridges. When you touch a surface, the, the oil on your skin leaves an imprint on that surface and and this has a uh, important significance in forensics flexion creases flexion creases are the folds of your skin that form when you flex a joint so when you flex your elbow you see the little folds of your skin on the inside of your elbow joint freckles liver spots and molds there are little parts on your body or little spots on your body with clusters of melanocytes. Now the difference between freckles and moles are that freckles are flat areas with which are rich in melanocytes versus moles are slightly elevated. Now moles can become cancerous whereas freckles are less likely to become cancerous. Another skin marking is a hemangioma. A hemangioma has a characteristic strawberry-like appearance and usually disappears in, in early to late childhood. Next we're going to go over an accessory structure of um, the skin, which is hair. Now hair is also called pilus, 
when you're referring to a single one, or pili when you're talking about multiple. Now, hair is composed of dead, hard, keratinized cells, and, and it's found on every part of the body except certain parts of genitalia, palmar and plantar surfaces, as well as on the lips. Now, the hair density is genetically determined. Men tend to have more hair on their face than women. And there are three types of hair in human beings. The first one is actually an evolutionary rem remnant of being furry. And it is the hair that is present on the body of a fetus. And it is called lanugo. The next one is very fine hair that is not very visible. You have to, to really carefully look to, to see it. And it's found all over thin skin, on children, and, and on the face of women. It's called vellus. So it, it, gives, it has that characteristic fuzzy appearance. And then you have the terminal hair, which is hair on, on which is the thick, more pigmented hair, which is coarse, uh, which is found on the arms, legs, uh, scalp, uh, eyebrows, eyelashes. So let's take a look, a zoomed in look at the structure of the human hair. Now each hair uh, filament has three parts. Let's start from the deepest part to the most superficial part. Down in the reticular region of the dermis, you have the hair bulb. This region is the hair bulb. Now the hair bulb has that characteristic bulbar appearance and it is the part of the hair where it originates from. It, it, it has stem cells from where the hair originates from. Next is the hair root, which is the part of the hair beneath the surface of the skin and the shaft is the part of hair above the surface of the skin. Here is a longitudinal section of the hair. Here is a cross section of the hair. And here's what I need you to know about it. In the longitudinal section, right down at the bottom, you have a section called dermal papilla of the hair. Here's the dermal papilla of the hair. Now it has blood vessels. Now these are the blood vessels that supply nutrition to the hair. They supply nutrition and oxygenated blood to the hair, take away deoxygenated blood to the hair. Now in the hair bulb, right at the very core, you have something called the hair matrix. Now the hair matrix, right here, the hair matrix is a layer of mitotically dividing cells. This is the only layer of cells that actually divide in the hair. Now this is how hair grows. As the hair as these cells divide by mitosis, the older cells are pushed upwards and outwards. So this is the only part of the hair that actually has cells that are alive. So the hair matrix. So you have the dermal papilla and you have the hair matrix. Now the deepest part or the core of the hair right here in this longitudinal section is called the medulla followed by the cortex followed by the cuticle. So you have the three layers of dead keratinocytes right here. The medulla, the cortex, and the cuticle. Now the hair follicle is the tube that the hair is present in. So this is the hair follicle. So think of it this way. When you pluck the hair, you pluck the hair root and the hair shaft off. The follicle is what remains empty. So the empty follicle is what remains. Now this is the follicle. The follicle contains the dermal root sheath and the epidermal root sheath, the epithelial root sheath and the connective tissue root sheath. Also known as the, so think of it this way, the epithelial root sheath is the outer root sheath, the connective tissue root sheath is the inner root sheath. The accessory structures of the hair are the hair root plexus. So this right here, 
Hugging or covering the hair bulb externally is a series of nerves. So this is why you feel pain when a hair is plucked. It's because of these nerves right here. And then you have the erector pili or the piloerector muscle right here, which allows the hair to stand upright. Now in animals, it, it gives an animal that fluffy appearance. It helps the animal with insulation. It makes the animal appear bigger and more intimidating to a predator and helps the animal survive. In human beings, however, goosebumps have no real significance. Now, in human beings, we have a wide variety of hair coloration or hair coloring or hair textures. What causes the different hair textures and different hair coloring? Hair coloring comes from melanin, the different amounts of melanin, and the hair texture comes from the shape of the hair pilus itself. So straight hair has a round pilus, wavy hair has an oval pilus, and curly hair has flat pilus. Pigment in hair, like I was talking about before, Brown and black hair has a pigment called eumelanin. Blonde hair has the yellowish pigment called pheomelanin. A person can have a mixture of different or varying amounts of eumelanin and pheomelanin. A person can also have varying levels of ovalness as far as the, the shape of the pilus is concerned. So there's different levels of waviness to people's hair. So let's take a look. This person has very, very dark brown, almost black hair, which is relatively straight. So she has a round pilus with eumelanin. This person has straight hair, so she has a round pilus with a little bit of eumelanin and a little bit of pheomelanin. This person has wavy to curly hair, so she has a highly oval pilus with both eumelanin and pheomelanin, and that's why she has red hair. Gray hair is when some hair has pigment, when some hair doesn't have pigment, and white hair has no pigment at all. The next concept we are going to go over is hair loss. The name for hair loss is alopecia. So hair loss can be because of genetic reasons. It can be because of physical stress to hair, or it can also be a side effect of medical treatments, such as chemotherapy, radiation therapy, or a side effect of different medications as well. So in the next part of this lecture, we are going to talk about the different glands of skin, as well as wounds and other skin disorders.